Hello, everybody. Good morning. This is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru on Just In Time Productions series, the Games Mastery series in particular. Episode 16, we are going to be talking about weather conditions and environment. When you're dealing with a role play game, one of the things that really assists the players to experience the game as you intend uh, is to have a clear understanding of what is going on in literally what in the world is going on. And so by having a clear understanding of what the conditions, climate, and weather uh, patterns are at that moment can really uh, assist in bringing the story to life and giving the player something to get a hold of in terms of understanding their um, place in the world. Now, when we talk about weather, there's a bunch of different categories we could go through, and I'm just going to outline it here at the beginning. We're going to be looking at, at weather in terms of wind, humidity, uh, barometric pressure, which is sort of associated, precipitation, which is sort of associated. We're also going to talk about conditions, conditions such as the visibility, the uh, terrain or surface conditions, and uh, even the noise uh, in an area to make sure that we can have a clear understanding of where the, the players are and what kind of conditions they're dealing with. Finally, we'll also be talking about the environment. So we'll talk about the climate in particular and what that might do to the encounter, as well as uh, localized populations and even the societal mores when we're talking about actual locations and places. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning, therefore, and let's talk about Da, 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 the wind. Now, in a perfect environment in a role play game, especially when you're dealing f with long range weaponry and uh, ranged attacks, it's really uh, useful to have the wind at lower levels. Whereas if you are trying to outrun somebody or want to uh, prevent them from actually getting to you, sometimes it's better to have high winds involved. But what they do, what each of them does, sort of, is affects, in particular, how the players will interact with the environment. So let's let's start at the low end of the spectrum and let's talk about a situation of dead calm. Now, in most situations, you might think that might be useful, as it would prevent players from having to deal with. Um, arrows be, uh, missing their target or things drifting such as boats or yacht uh, boats or uh, rafts or such but uh, dead calm can actually be in terms of a role play setting a really horrible condition particularly if you are on a aboard a sailing vessel uh, of course a dead calm would prevent you from being able to utilize the wind to make any headway and particularly if weather persists uh, it can be dangerous. Um, above that would be a light breeze, and while this might have a cooling or a warming effect, it doesn't necessarily have to impact or impede uh, range weaponry. Uh, a light wind might affect, for example, a feather fall or something along that lines, but it wouldn't necessarily be a uh, something that can, can't be overcome by uh, readjusting aim. Uh, stronger winds, such as strong winds or even gusty conditions, uh, would make it uh, more challenging in terms of uh, ranged weaponry and archery and such. But a particular uh, note are conditions of gale force winds or even hurricanes. These high end wind events can actually prevent people from doing simple things like running across the street or uh, dodging an incoming foe simply by knocking you off your balance. So when you are setting up your situation, you may want to consider whether you want there to be uh, poorer conditions than optimal in terms of wind speeds just to mess with the players. It also is great for flavor effect, even if you're not going to use the larger ones, simply reminding the players that there is a wind at all, that there actually is a breeze passing through the area, can add a level of uh, real, realism to your game and make it feel more at home. Now when we talk about humidity, this is maybe a little wonky, but I found it particularly useful to describe uh, 
changing weather patterns, especially if there's a shift that I intend that's going to be abnormal. It's great to have uh, an understanding of where the pressure gauge is and uh, whether or not it's a, a rising barometer or a falling barometer and uh, how that can impact the players is is uh, one, one of uh, not only emotional state and making them aware of what might happen, but also of giving those players an opportunity to plan for uh, changes based on it. So if you start at the lower end of the spectrum, a, a bottomed out uh, pressure, a very, very low pressure indicates an area of Consider, considerable unrest. Um, ironically, it's not as bad as a falling barometer, and I'll go into that a little bit more here in a second, but just realize that a low pressure system will indicate uh, considerable cloud cover. Uh, hey, there, there's Scott. How are you doing this morning, sir? We're talking about uh, weather in an adventure, and we've already talked a bit about wind. You'll probably, probably will go back and listen to that in a little bit, but Right now, we're actually talking about uh, barometric pressure. And as I started to say, it's a, a little wonky, but having a an understanding of how pressure can impact the game uh, can make the, f the adventure feel more real, more alive to the players, and also allow them to associate more directly with their characters because we as human beings have, a, have experienced these uh, changing pressures and what they do to the weather. And by being able to give hints and uh, suggestions to the players based on those weather conditions, you make it feel more at home for them. So a low blood, a low barometric pressure means heavy cloud cover. Uh, the air is probably staling or becoming more flat, uh, although it is that omin uh, ominous point in a, in a weather pattern when there's change in a foot. Either it's going to continue falling or it's going to start to rise. And so even in a situation where the players are already in danger of bad weather, just giving them a hint that the weather uh, is no longer falling and is becoming more stable uh, can actually in, uh, hearten them and uh, incre increase their morale. Now the next category is the actual falling barometer. And a falling barometer means that uh, weather is, is worsening, it's becoming more unstable, it's becoming uh, less calm. And while the, a falling barometer doesn't necessarily mean rainfall, falling barometer does mean that the weather patterns are changing in an adverse direction towards higher humidity, towards um, heavier air literally. It's, it's kind of an odd comparison, but a low pressure uh, is uh, unstable and they, I mean, a low pressure is ominous and a high pressure is uh, perhaps optimal, but a high pressure also means un, uh, a lack of change. So realize that a constant barometer is optimally what the players will want on a usual basis, whether it's simply have a constant barometer, everything's fine exactly as it is. And this brings an interesting point. Weather, weather, weather patterns in games generally don't get a lot of attention paid to them. Um, recently, I've started to find ways to allow uh, game masters to track this more readily. And so in the Game Mastery series, I'll uh, recommend a couple of tools that will, will help you to maintain a knowledge and awareness of these uh, climatological conditions. But uh, just realize that a constant barometric pressure means things are going to stay the same. Uh, a rising barometer or a increase in pressure will mean that there is actually less cloud cover as the cloud cover is being pushed away by that higher pressure. And uh, ultimately, a high pressure system generally means leads to clear skies, sometimes increased winds, and certainly a uh, humidity level that is uh, not as adverse. Now we'll go into that a little bit more, but I did want to mention two points where barometric pressure feed into uh, the actual humidity and weather conditions in a location. The first of, first of which is called the dew point. Uh, 
And the dew point is the point when the atmosphere becomes so saturated with water that it literally can't take any more uh, water vapor. Uh, this does not necessarily, uh, I mean, for example, a very low, uh, low barometric pressure doesn't necessarily mean it will be raining, but a high dew point would mean that you're closer to rain. Now this leads to uh, a little more wonky term, and that's relative humidity. And while I, they, they, these other terms that I've referred to, low, rising, high, and such, are all measures of relative humidity, the very term relative humidity means what are the chances that rain is going to fall. And so although barometric pressure does not directly relate, it does uh, indirectly relate to relative humidity and basically the comfort of the environment. So if you have a relative high humidity, there's uh, less likelihood you'll be able to uh, gain respite from heat because the air is already as moist as it can be, so it will not wick off or evo evaporate the moisture from your body. So uh, a player will have to realize that their uh, sweating is not being relieved by the weather if you have a relative uh, high relative for humidity. So just be aware that these numbers will lead to a better understanding. So let's let's go and look at these numbers now in reference to what they do. Um, when you have uh, uh, cold, uh, cold, or is actually going to be uh, a relatively low it's going to have a high relative barometric pressure, yes. So it's high relative humidity. It also means that the dew point is relatively low, which means, or relatively high, which means that uh, almost every day there's going to be dew on the ground, mist and water. That's why uh, jungle settings tend to be so boggy and uh, moist and damp is because the relative humidity is high. So yes, that is correct. You'd have a high relative barometric pressure. That doesn't mean your barometer will be a high pressure system always because high systems remember mean that there is uh, going to be clear skies and while there will be certainly some clear skies there's going to be a lot of changes in the barometric pressure because of the actually again going wonky here and just for for relative knowledge for game masters it's not something you need to know it's not, nothing in any book that you're going to need for uh, a rule system, but when you have a system that has uh, radical changes of temperatures, highs to lows, you end up with uh, a lot more weather activity and therefore a v highly variable pressure system. So you'll have uh, large storms form and then as they leave the area it'll be, be calm an area. Uh, even in the American Midwest, for example, uh, in Kansas, which has a relatively uh, low uh, relative pressure, nonetheless, they, the, the weather will heat up over a landmass, creating a change in barometric pressure, which uh, usually represents a falling uh, barometric pressure and therefore a, an increase in the storm uh, from uh, just a weather pattern to being a true on storm and then as it passes through and pours down rain and hail and such uh, the pressure relieves relatively quickly and within a day or so the storm falls apart whereas in an area like Colt or Cholta or however you want to pronounce it uh, Colt in that nation there's going to be a higher relative uh, humidity but a relatively low barometric pressure as the storms literally will rise and fall within a day. And so you'll have almost, it'll be almost as if you have rain falling, falling from clear skies because it won't take much for the, the, the pressure, uh, for, for the uh, air in the area to become saturated with the amount of water that's there and thereby not be able to gain any more and therefore a slight change in temperature will cause it to dump its rain as well. So that's the reason why they, that, that's the effect of which they speak of as a greenhouse effect. You have a uh, high, um, high, uh, high, higher um, moisture levels in the air, which means a high humidity and therefore a high relative humidity, but a relatively low pressure system in the area.
So when we look at these, what they lead to is they lead to such things as uh, precipitation. And when we speak of precipitation, of course, precipitation can take a lot of different levels, and these can actually uh, radically uh, affect a game in session. For example, no precipitation, no rain, no problem. Majority of games that I know stay in an environment of almost perfectly uh, no precipitation. Occasionally for flavor, a game master will talk about a mist in the moors or even suggest that a light drizzle might be falling. But again, in human life, usually those kind of situations can be avoided simply by going inside of a building so we don't think about what the long-term effects of a, of a constant drizzle or a steady mist might cause. And what we have to be, be aware of is that moisture anywhere for an extended period of time is going to be caustic and damaging. On the low end, for example, if you're simply in a place that's covered with mist, it won't take long until you're having to uh, re re literally rub the moisture out of your eyes. Your skin is going to become uh, coated with uh, the mist combined with a little bit of perhaps your body sweat. but. This will become an inconvenience, not in the short term, but by the you've been in it for half a day, your saturation will be including all of your clothes, and then you have to worry about things like rashes and uh, irritations occurring wherever armor and clothing comes in contact with flesh in a restricted manner. So uh, whenever you've got uh, joints in your armor or um, when you're dealing with like picking up weapons and such, everything's going to be covered with this moisture. That's not bad enough, but full on steady rain can be really problematic because it starts to obscure vision. It is pervasive into your gear, even well secured materials in your backpack can start to become moist as the humidity and the, and the, and the rain actually starts to seep into the packs as well. Uh, even more dangerous than that are the full-on downpours, such as in a, uh, a jungle setting where the rains are going to fall in a short order to, to, dump, to uh, release some of that moisture back to the ground. And in the, the opposite kind of a climate where you have uh, snows and heavy snow, they can, they can occlude vision, they can become problematic in uh, reducing your move rate. If it's a particularly heavy snow, it also can uh, complicate uh, transferring stuff out of gear bags and things like that as the snow will just get into everything. Uh, of course, this also can be uh, a problem if the moisture falls at a steady rate in what's either known as a torrent or a blanket. So in the case of, of snow, it'll fall in a blanket, it'll just come down steadily blocking line of sight and adding moisture and not to mention condensation within packs and things like that. And uh, ultimately a torrent can also wash things off and actually damage gear. Of course, beyond that, you have the extremes of a full on monsoon where you're having rain in, in terms of double digit inches per hour, uh, where you have perhaps hail stones larger and more annoying than standard you know rainfall or whatever and then ultimately if you add a little bit of uh, wind to it you can turn a, any snowstorm into a blizzard and uh, through the game, game mastery series you'll be able to pick up uh, what those minuses and modifiers would be to make your game not only seem more real but uh, more uh, dangerous and uh, make the weather something to actually be concerned with. Now when we talk about games conditions, we've talked about the ones that are caused by weather and and as I said in the in the course we'll go into the particulars of these and how they impact the game. But let's talk a little bit about conditions that are beyond that. Granted we were talking about uh, humidity and that's going to lead to uh, the actual visibility of a scene. Again, most games you don't consider what what uh, cloud cover and such might do to your situation. So we all hope for absolutely clear weather. But from that, you of course can move into partially cloudy areas, and thereby perhaps uh, 
positively or negatively impacting somebody's ability to be stealthy. Uh, if a you know a person is moving through a shadow and suddenly that shadow isn't there anymore because the sun broke out from between a few clouds, that could cause some uh, difficulty for your um, rogues and such or your rangers. Uh, also, obscure. Uh, uh, partially cloudy sky can interfere with a ranger's ability to track because the shadows that define the tracks on the ground become less measurable. Uh, beyond that, you have, uh, it's again kind of wonky, but an obscured sky. This is where the cloud cover is thick enough and constant enough to simply blot out uh, the solar body. This can affect uh, the group's ability to understand the passage of time, because they won't be able to watch the sun process across the sky, it can also increase the shadows and thereby make it better for those races and creatures that need to be sneaky to get to their targets. Of course, if your humidity continues to increase and does not have the relief of forming into clouds, the sky can become hazy, and this is Actually, we in Southern California can kind of see this outside on certain days where the the distant hills become less visible because there's something obscuring the sky itself and creating a haze. And this haze can become rather extreme, forming into a moisture barrier, uh, which tra uh, translates to a mist, which reduces, again, your overall visibility. Uh, but it also starts to add a little bit of moisture to the problem. Of course, from from a light mist, you can move to true fog, and ultimately to an entire dense cloud uh, upon the ground surface, which uh, in air traffic control is known as socked in. Uh, this refers, of course, to the wind sock. And when you get to the point where you can't see that wind sock from a distance to tell what the wind is, uh, you're socked in. Your field is is basically unavailable for landing. But in terms of games, of course, this is when the the evil villain can ride his cavalry through the through the lands and terrify people simply by the sound of their approach. Speaking of surface conditions, we also need to talk about what the ground itself is like when we're talking about the adventure. For example, if you are in, say, an area that's relatively muddy, like a, a, a jungle or a cult in particular, that's pretty common. But on occasion, there'll be a break in the weather where it'll be dry for several days. And now the ground will become desiccated. The leaves will become crinkly and crisp. Even the dirt itself will leave a, a layer that can be kind of crunchy as the players walk through it, realizing that the desiccated terrain can actually provide advantage on those trying to hear uh, those people who are being sneaky and conversely reduce the ability to stealth through a terrain is kind of a useful thing, particularly if you've got a, a group of adventurers who are somewhat uh, min-maxing their stealth capabilities in every encounter. Suddenly putting them in a place where the ground is surprisingly desiccated for whatever reason will definitely put a hamper in their plans. Uh, conversely, you can simply make it uh, a location that is wet. And when every leaf in the, in the, in the, in the jungle is uh, covered with dew or rainfall, moving through it not only will get your character's equipment wet as he passes over and beyond the leaves, but it also will leave a clear pathway for others to see in the forest where he's gone, where the leaves have actually dumped their fluid. So again, if you're looking for ways to counteract a particularly annoyingly uh, sneaky group, just add a little bit of water. Of course, ultimately this leads to a muddy condition, and mud has its own unique problems. Not only are tracks easier to create and more difficult to remove, but they also will possibly start to catch boots, uh, particularly on the heavier uh, creatures, and the type of boots will actually affect this as well. So a person who is in light boots, generally they're made with doe hide, and if the shoe is properly made, that the foot as it rises up will be like a deer's flesh and pass against the moisture more easily. So there are ways even for a player to take advantage of these awarenesses. Um, now if a 
the landscape becomes completely saturated, completely coated with the fluids. Now you have a different problem, and that is the soil is a muck, a mire. It, it has no place for any more water to go into it, so water begins to pool. And therefore, you're adding to the noise factor as they have stomp and, and splash through uh, the saturated terrain. Now, let's go back to talking a little bit about the other end of the of the weather spectrum, where the ground is snow covered. You fall into a similar bollocks when being stealthy because you're going to leave tracks in the snow, and the more more moist the snow is, the more pronounced those footsteps will be. Of course, when you get to the colder temperatures, now you're dealing with the, 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 the terrain and vegetation beginning to freeze, which also makes it crispy, crunchy, more difficult to pass through. But it also adds a different layer of the loss of body temperature. A person traipsing through the forest or a jungle, well, let's go with forest, uh, that is on the edge of freezing. As they pass into things that are snow covered, they're going to get more moisture. That moisture is going to make the temperature transference easier and so a moist wet and moist wet and cold environment is really a great way to drag the players towards fatigue in a quicker fashion now when the soil becomes permafrost they have a different problem now the good news is that a permafrost environment may be frozen enough that it'll keep footsteps from passing through it but if the players ever needed to dig into the ground for whatever reason whether it be uh, using spikes to pitch a tent or whatever, if it's permafrost, they're going to have a whole new set of challenges based on the surface conditions because the soil literally becomes impenetrable like a concrete as the different clays stick together and make it more difficult. So now we're going to talk a little bit about man-made uh, conditions. And the first one we're going to talk about is uh, noise. Uh, there's some, uh, again, some uh, positives and negatives to these, so I think you'll kind of see this as we go along. We'll start with a completely dead, silent condition. This is actually quite rare and generally has to do with uh, apex predators or other uh, predatory creatures that will threaten the other animals and, and life, uh, wildlife. To, to drive it to silence because uh, generally speaking there's usually not a complete dead condition with 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 uh, animals while there may be a completely dead condition for for the wind I mean if, if you're in an environment that has uh, moderate relative humidity and high high uh, barometric pressure not only is that going to be clear but it's also going to be still there's not going to be a lot of breeze blowing around it's only when other factors start to play into it that wind begins. So let's move from the dead silent, which is again adversarial in a lot of ways, but does feature does seem to uh, enhance the uh, stealth action because it's not you can actually hear yourself and thereby reduce your your own noise. Uh, the next tier of this is actually the default, which is a natural environment: birds uh, chirping in the trees, uh, plants. Uh, waving in, in the winds, uh, insects buzzing away and such like. These are all natural sounds and are the default normal condition. Then beyond that you start to have a, a breezy condition and a breezy condition can also be emulated by uh, a population. So if there are people and they are busy doing commerce, uh, working, carrying stuff around, there's going to be a noise level that's going to approximate a breezy day in terms of what you can hear and things like that. Now breezy, of course, adds to it the uh, sensory issues of uh, being you know, naturally smelly and stuff and, and the wind carrying your scent down, down, downwind, so to speak. But uh, from a noise level, just consider it to be breezy, give some light modifiers, but not a lot. But the issue, again, is that you're giving the players more to work with because they're getting a better feel for where they are. And so even suggesting that they smell something might lead them to the conclusion that, oh, my goodness, we might be sending a, sending a smell signature down line to, downwind as well. From this, you go to a windier condition. This is where the wind itself is creating a noise, generally through trees or vegetation. But it again approximates a more noisy location if you are in a marketplace and there's a lot of 
lot of activity going on. It's going to be noisy, and this is going to be comparable in sound to a windy environment. And again, the windy environment is going to carry your scent even further and more uh, strongly. Of course, beyond that, you can get to a crowded environment where there's just people shouting and hollering at one each other. Usually this is when there's a conflict or a challenge and people are, are challenging one another. But this approximates to a gusty environment where it's difficult to hear yourself speak, but your, your, your mind is still cleared. Ultimately, above that will be shrieking and piercing noises. This is a, a howling wind at the, at the near uh, typhoon level winds, but it also... Uh, uh, represents the sounds of, say, a shrieking animal, something that's going to definitely draw your attention and affect your ability to carry on a conversation. And ultimately, at the highest level, this would be a roaring crowd, the roar of the ocean, the ear-splitting screams of, of a dragon or something. And at this level, not only is speech difficult, clear thinking can be modified. So you may have uh, pluses or minuses. And in the Game Mastery series, we'll have actual... Uh, tabular minuses and adjustments to activities, both for the positive and the negative for these different varying vari these different variables. Now let's talk, here's we're coming close to the end of the video, we're just going to talk about the actual environment that players can find themselves in. And we're going to look at these again, starting with the natural and moving to the man-made, if you will. So in the first we're going to talk about the environment in terms of climate. At the extreme cold end you have Arctic environments, the tops of mountains, tundra, the biting cold, high wind permafrost environment that is unrelenting. And even these have weather patterns, so you can have a horrible blizzard or a light drizzle. Um, the, the different, like for example, a Chinook wind is known as a snow killer because that wind carries with it uh, a warmer rainfall that actually can cut through ice and make travel precarious, slippery, and such. Uh, from there, moving down, you go into regular mountainous terrain. And while this has a little bit more opportunity for handholds and digging in the terrain, nonetheless, it's still fairly uh, dangerous and caustic where players can actually harm themselves by slipping and sliding if the terrain becomes moist or the humidity uh, starts to rise. And uh, beyond that, we're going to talk about the, or, or let's, let's talk a bit about uh, savannas or plains. While these seem optimal because they're wide open spaces, one of the greatest challenges to a wide open space is that it's a wide open space. So monsters with extremely good vision, creatures that attack from a long distance, creatures with stealth that are small, all can be optimized in uh, a savanna environment because grasses are tall, the wind moves them already naturally, so a creature moving through them may not be heard or seen. Uh, of course, if you take that same terrain and you remove the plant life, now you're talking about a desert. And deserts, are, again, are big open spaces, but generally a desert is going to be either a cold uh, steps environment or a very warm uh, desert environment. Of course, when you go to the, the humid, the, 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 the rainforest areas, you're going to have a marshy environment where the ground is virtually a bog, where the swamps themselves become almost an adversary that the, that the player characters have to learn to contend with. In a more temperate zone, you'll find forests, which tend to be drier on the floor, have less underbrush, but have... Uh, a, a canopy under which the players can move and therefore occlude uh, perhaps predators in the air and things like that. And a jungle will have all of the marsh and such, but add to that the uh, reduced visibility of a forest. Now let's, let's move to talking about people for a minute. A, a, a climate, or rather an environment, can include a population. And if you're at the ultra extreme end of that, of course, it's a completely uninhabited area where there are no social groups of humanoids. These are almost non-existent in the fantasy realm because anything that is left un uninhabited ultimately is a great place for a monster or a uh, community of uh, monstrous uh, creature types from humanoids to 
uh, more fer feral creature types like gnolls and such. Of course, beyond that, you have sparsely populated areas. Generally, these will be along frontiers where it's just untenable to protect them all the time. So they'll be sparsely populated because the few people that are there are constantly in danger of being attacked by whatever wee beasties or monsters that are in the area. As you move closer to towns and such, it'll become more rural where homes are more secure. The terrain thereabouts is being used for farming or ranching or whatever. Then moving beyond that, you move into communal areas where houses are fairly close together, neighbors know each other, there's uh, unspoken safety rules and such for operating within these. Then on to the, from this, you move into specific towns and villages that identify themselves and have rules and mores above uh, simple self-protection. And then it will ultimately you'll move into higher populated areas where there is commerce, such as trade uh, routes and things like this, and uh, populated areas where there are full-on cities that develop. And of course, beyond that, you have the almost the ridiculous. This is areas where the populations have become almost urban, and there are nation, national capitals and such. And so the city-state is at the high end of this within the fantasy settings, and uh, ultimately an uninhabited wilderness is at the other. Now, even when you've got a society, you have to look at it from a standpoint of what kind of environment is going on within the, that area. Uh, ultimately, it seems crazy, but you might have uh, an urban area that is complete anarchy. Whatever governmental system they have is not doing its job, and people are able to do whatever they want. The concept of the American Wild West and things like that is a nearly anarchical environment, certainly in many of the post-apocalyptic post games out there, you will have a full-on anarchy in many locations, but beyond that you'll start to have areas that are just uncivilized. In other words, they follow, they know what the rules are, generally they protect themselves, but they're uncouth. They have social mores that wouldn't do well in the city. This is the kind of environments that barbarians will find themselves in. Beyond that you have tribal areas where there are now familial and connection uh, between individuals that follow some sort of code, whether it be uh, the code of the largest is in chargest or something like that, all the way up to uh, formalized governmental systems. But they're tribal in nature. They're, they're, they're cliquish. They, they hold together as a whole, but only in a loose fashion. Beyond that, you start to have confederacies such as clans that start to develop where families protect one another and even go to war with one another so that the various clans become more galvanized. Beyond that, you have these larger communities where the clans actually agree to share or agree to have commerce with one another. And these communities then give rise to guilds and tradesmen who are fostering this community's development by providing them with the services for a fee or whatever. And a guild and trade environment is much more closely associated with towns and villages and moving towards the cities, whereas ultimately at the high end when you have a large enough population, a governmental regime, a totalitarian one, can form. And these totalitarian governments can be as, as kind, if you will, as a benevolent monarch all the way to a uh, evil and slave, slavish uh, totalitarian emperor. So realize that even as you're developing the environment, you need to take into account what the population's impact will be so that characters that grow up in that area will have the right mentality when they're playing through the session because it'll feel more like their home. So at this, at this point, I've gone through the information that I have for this session. Uh, this material will be uh, available the next uh, three to six months as we're starting to put together the actual academy uh, processes and there'll be more information on that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this is Monday, uh, this is fun day, so, or, so we will be uh, doing Adventures League this afternoon. Uh, thank you for participating in the show and I hope to uh, see you guys at the, at the events. This is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru for Just-in-Time Productions Games Mastery Series. Thank you and have a great day.